Okay, we're going to take a look at chapter 12, looking at solutions. As a note, we are going to return to this chapter very, very late in the year after we cover intermolecular forces, but I want to at least get the basic idea of solutions down before we proceed. So, uh, first we're going to look at section 12.3, looking at what energy is involved in solution formation. So as it says, we can see energy changes that uh, there's going to be energy changes associated with the solution making process. And what we're going to do is view the solution formation in three steps, and each with their own change in enthalpy or heat, which we're going to abbreviate as a delta H change in enthalpy. So first, when a solution is formed, we need to separate the solute particles from one another. And always view the breaking of any attractive forces requires the input of energy. It's always going to be endothermic. So to break apart those attractive forces holding the solute together is an endothermic process, so delta H will be positive. Uh, likewise, we have to separate the solvent particles from one another. So because again, we're overcoming intermolecular forces. Anytime we have to break attractive forces requires the input of energy. And that's what we see here. So, so far, we're breaking um, the attractive forces. We're separating the solute, endothermic. We're uh, separating the solvent, endothermic. Finally, we're going to have the solute and solvent attract one another. Anytime we create attractive forces, it's always exothermic. So in this case, the delta H of the total of that attractive forces is going to be negative. It's going to be exothermic. Now, the total result really depends upon how big each factor is. So a overall solution formation could be exothermic if that last step, that exothermic step, is larger than the endothermic steps before it. It could be endothermic if, well, the endothermic steps end up bigger. It really could go any direction, endothermic or exothermic. Uh, finally, we're going to look at ways of expressing concentration. I will say right now, there's lots and lots and lots of different units of concentration, but there's really only two that we're concerned with in AP chemistry. Um, well, there's also the qualitative version. So we could say things like dilute and concentrate, they're qualitative statements. They're not particularly useful um, in terms of calculations, good for descriptive things, not in terms of calculation things. And that's what it means there. I'm not going to read that. But again, we're going to focus on the quantitative description. So the first is mole fraction. Um, mole fraction, very common. We talked a little bit about mole fraction uh, back in uh, chapter five. And it's, it's a fraction. It's parts over a whole. So mole fraction, uh, capital X, is just the moles of a component, so one particular part of the mixture over the total moles of all the components. It's a part over a whole. It's unitless because it's moles over moles, and so moles cancel out. Um, and again, if you have different uh, components, let's say in a mixture, the mole fraction of all the components added up should equal one if you did it right. Uh, next is molarity. This is the big one. Uh, now, uh, if you've taken chemistry, you might have learned there's something called molality. Uh, we do not deal with molality in AP chemistry. It's molarity only. Uh, molarity is a capital M, and it's moles of solute to volume of solution. You, uh, I've always seen it as liters. So moles of solute per liters of solution. So a few things with this, because molarity is the big, big, big one. You can be asked to solve for molarity. To solve for molarity, we need moles of solute and liters of solution. Divide the two. You could do stoichiometry to solve for the moles of solute using that. Um, you can use molarity to do stoichiometry, viewing that whatever the molarity is, that's how many moles of solute you have per one liter of solution. So if something is a 2.3 molar solution, that means it is 2.3 moles of solute per one liter of solution. So once again, molarity can be used in stoichiometry or you can use stoichiometry to solve for molarity. Very common tricks in AP chemistry. 
um, blah, 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 blah. We can convert. So an example. So here we have a solution, 5 grams, grams of toluene, 20, uh, 225 grams of benzene, a certain density. We want to know the molarity. So again, lots of information here. So we need to ask ourselves, since they're asking for molarity, what do I need? I need moles of solute and liters of solution. Now, I don't have any of that really, but I do have grams of toluene. And if we have grams, what can we find? That's right, moles. And then I have density, which is mass to a volume. So I can use that to find a volume. So to find molarity, we're gonna need moles of toluene and volume of solution. So there's the math. So five grams of toluene, molar mass on the bottom, one mole on top, that gives me moles of toluene. Now we're gonna use the find volume by using density. So density, we actually have 230 grams of the substance. So I take that 230 grams, I use the density because it's um, grams over milliliters, but I'm solving for milliliters, so I can have that on top. And I get my answer. I turn that to 0.263 liters. And I get my answer. And we did all that, and that's this chapter.